I'm Vicki Galvin. Welcome to Instrumental Analysis. This is week seven and we've been talking about spectrophotometers. And what we're going to do in this mini lecture is really focus on the detector. Your eye is one of the best detectors I can think of for visible radiation. But of course to do infrared or ultraviolet you need help. And in fact your light, your eye can't really see single photons nor does it want to be tacked onto an instrument for hours on end. So what you're really looking at are instruments that can take photons that emanate after they pass through the sample and quantify how many of them are, ideally with very, very low detection limit. So in this overview of detectors, I think it stresses one of the most important decisions you have when you choose a detector. It's kind of the, you know, buck stops your decision. Your detector has to work for the wavelength range that you're measuring. So at the top here, you see ultraviolet detectors. It's got to work for the ultraviolet if that's what you're doing. So for example, you can use a silicon photodiode, but if you're really trying to do serious ultraviolet spectroscopy, you can't use a silicon photodiode. It doesn't go out far enough into the ultraviolet. For infrared, you can't be using a PMT or a photomultiplier tube because it doesn't absorb in the infrared. So kind of the first stop is to realize that infrared detectors are very different beasts than the detectors you use for UV vis, which are really this top area. Now, the reason the detector is so important is shown here over the right. I want you to look at all of these data sets and tell me how is the one that's marked 100 different than the one that's marked 1. Well, the one that's marked 100, you can see the peaks, and the one that's marked 1, you can barely see the peaks. And that's because the signal to noise is really good on the bottom one. And what controls that is, of course, the number of photons, but it's also the sensitivity of the detector. If your detector sees one photon and makes a lot of current, then you're going to have really good signal to noise. If its sensitivity is low, you're going to be fighting that, and that can actually hinder your ability to make quantitative measurements. So the table leaves out that important factor of sensitivity. It gives you a wavelength range. You should be sensitive enough, but it doesn't really tell you how much better is a photomultiplier tube than, let's say, a silicon photodiode. So in using this table, and we'll talk about this at the very end of the lecture, in choosing a detector, getting one that you know is going to at least be functional in your wavelength range is kind of your very first question. Then you start to get into the cost and the maintenance issues later. So photomultiplier tubes are the first kind of detector I used when I started to do optical spectroscopy now more than 20 years ago. Uh, a PMT is basically based on the photoelectric effect. Light hits a cathode and it generates electrons. What's important in a PMT is those electrons don't just make a current, because if you did, one photon would make one electron, and that wouldn't be very good. Rather, the electrons cascade down into other cathodes, and for every time the electron hits, many more secondary electrons are generated. So it's a cascade effect where one photon can maybe make 100,000 or even up to 10 million electrons. That allows you to do photon counting, meaning you get enough of a current out of a PMT that a single photon can generate a detectable signal. And that's super powerful, and that's why in a lot of research-grade operations, PMTs are still the photo detector of choice. So if you have a, set, have a system which for some reason you don't have a lot of photons to detect, then PMTs are kind of your only way to go. And they're going to be most valuable when we do fluorescent spectroscopy, which I won't be talking about. For absorption spectroscopy, a little bit less valuable because usually you have a lot of photons present in absorption spectroscopy. Remember, you're detecting the attenuation of the light through a sample. So unless your sample is basically black, there's usually no reason to detect small numbers of photons. Photodiode arrays are probably a more common kind of newfangled detector to see. This is a picture of one of them for Wikimedia. They're, they're basically little tiny chips that are built based on the same things that build the, you know, computer chips in your cell phones or in your computers. And all of that technology for microfabrication has allowed people to make silicon PN junction diodes in very, very small, compact ways. And they put them together in these lines called photodiode arrays. And this is their frequency response. It pretty much mirrors the absorption of silicon. Silicon is an indirect band gap semiconductor. I won't define that. But it's a substance that when light hits it, it creates carriers. And if you've created a device structure in silicon, those carriers can modulate the electrical properties you're measuring. And from that, you can detect a signal. So in this case, your junctions are biased. And that means that when light hits them, you're going to create a balance of electrons and holes that you're going to be able to detect. And you're going to be able to say exactly how many electrons and holes you've created as a function of distance along this long, thin line. So it's an example of a, of a kind of detector you can use for multi-channel detection. 
So photodiode array, because it's spatially spread out, can be matched to a grating that spreads out the light. So you don't have to rotate the grating, you keep it fixed, and the photodiode tells you all of the wavelengths present in your data. And this is the PDA that we were talking about for the high-performance liquid chromatography systems. So it's really perfect for multi-channel detection, but has really, really crummy photon detection capabilities, like none. So it's not nearly as sensitive as a PMT tube. Now, if you have a lot of money to spend and you're really pushing on research, then the kind of grandfather, you know, more than the step up from the photodiode array is something called a charge coupled device. I consider it a cousin of it. It's still based on silicon, so it's got all of the advantages of microfab built in, but now when light hits, the charges you create, you're biased, so they go and they stick to an electrode that you've patterned onto the surface. So it's called literally a well. So in this example, the minus 5 volts is less of a well than the minus 10 volts. But the light comes in, it creates charge, and that charge migrates to this electrode that you patterned on top. And how much charge you collect in the well depends on the voltage and the dimensions of the well, which because of all of these great, you know, smaller and smaller circuits, you can do in very small volumes. And so you get basically a string of these wells, and each of them think about counting raindrops. Each time a photon hits, creates a charge, and it goes and sits in the well until the wells fill up. And then to read them out, the most common way I'm familiar is you actually sweep the voltages and you literally push the charge off off to the side to a bucket. So this has got five drops, and then there's three drops, and then there's 15,000 drops. And that's actually how you count, is usually through current that you collect after sweeping the voltages of all of the CCD wells, like in one line. So your readout is done in that way. And so what's really powerful about CCDs, of course, is like a photodiode array, they're spatial. So if you're separating the light, you don't have to rotate the grating to let some of the red, some of the blue, some of the green get on. Basically, it's all there and you get it all at once. So you can have really good statistics because you have very rapid detection. And in fact, there are some new CCD types that build some gain into these device structures that let one photon turn into more than one electron, which really helps you even more. So CCDs are now able in certain wavelength ranges to rival PMTs for their sensitivity, but they're super expensive and their wavelength ranges are of course limited to the wavelength of silicon, which is shown here. So depending on where you want to operate, like if you're trying to do a CCD out in the UV, that can be really hard to do. And they can be order to two orders of magnitude more expensive than the other examples. So when you're choosing a detector for a spectrophotometer, really the first and foremost question is what is your wavelength range? We didn't really talk a lot about the infrared detectors because there are, you can use CCDs for some of the near IR, but they're pretty simple systems. Um, MCT or mercury cadmium telluride systems are the ones I'm familiar with. Um, you often have to cool them with liquid nitrogen so they don't pick up a background, but other than that, they're pretty standard, and they're not what limit the performance of infrared spectrometers. If you need multi-wavelength detection in a spectrometer, or sorry, in a detector, you're going to need to pick a CCD or a photodiode array for optical absorption. You need to think about how sensitive your measurement needs to be, and assuming you're not measuring black samples, at least for absorption spectroscopy, you're not going to be bumping up against not having enough photons. But in fluorescent spectroscopy, that's a, or Raman spectroscopy, that's a whole other issue. And we won't be going to those, but just to be aware that typically you're going to have plenty of photons if you're doing optical or infrared absorption spectroscopy of the type we're talking about. And then finally, what's your budget? If you're a well-funded research lab that does very, very careful spectroscopy, you might spring for a back-thin silicon CCD that's intensified, and that thing might cost fifty or $60,000 just for the detector, whereas if you're buying a tiny little photodiode array that's going to fit in your HPLC, that only might be 8000 So those are the kinds of questions you need to think about when you choose your detector for either infrared or optical absorption. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time.